Hey, are you ready to grow your business? You have checked out the number one resource for business leaders, entrepreneurs, startup founders, and managers. And we're going to teach you how to grow and scale your business with real actionable steps. There's no fluff in this podcast. It's just good advice. Check out this episode. If you're a first-time listener, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And if you enjoy this episode, leave us a five-star review. Today's episode is with Chris Hervishon, and we're going to be talking about all things important for actually managing the finances of your business. It's one of the things that many business owners are totally clueless about. It's like, where do I start when it comes to the finances of my business? We're going to be talking about it today. Stay tuned. Here comes your good advice. Hey, thanks for checking out another episode of the Good Advice Podcast. Here's the deal. Money can be really complicated. It can be really challenging when it comes to running your business. What the heck's a P&L? What is cash flow? How do, I, how do I actually make sure I have the money to pay the bills that are coming in and also paying myself something so that I'm not the starving entrepreneur? Well, today's guest is a pretty incredible person. He's got a, a wild background as a former pro golfer. I don't know if we're going to be talking about golf tips today, but we might, we might you know, pepper some in today. But Chris Hervishan, he's the owner of Chris Hervishan CPA CVA. And he's the go-to accounting and tax expert for the small business owner. He's here with us today. He's going to be sharing some of his insights. Chris, it's so great to have you here today. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Now, whereabouts are you calling in from? Geographically, I'm in Hilton Head, South Carolina. Okay, cool. Rock on, man. So how's the weather? Always got to ask. Uh, today it's a little bit wet, but, uh, as we're recording this, we've gotten past, you know, the coldness of, of winter, which really only lasts like two months here. And we're on the tail end of pollen season. So, you know, we're, we're getting into the sweet spot right now. I, I've noticed that like anyone I talk to, like, regardless of wherever they live, everyone, you don't like the joke, like, oh, we get all four seasons in like a single day, or like, you never know what the weather's like. And like, this is kind of like a go-to, like everyone says this about their area, but you're telling me South Carolina, the winter, it's not very long. It's pretty short. No, January, February, it's, you know, fifties, maybe. Oh, wow. That's really mild. Jeez. You guys get any snow? It's well, we had snow in 2000 and I want to say it was 16, 16 or 17. Goodness. Once. Yeah. But I'm originally from New Jersey. So, you know, I'm used to, or I was used to the cold, you know, when it's in the teens and the twenties and it's snowing all the time and, and that sort of thing. And I, I think that I've gotten soft now because in South Carolina, <laughs> when it's, you know, if it's below 60, like I'm, I'm not going to go outside, I get the heat <laughs> cranked up, it's a whole thing. And, sure. you know, it, it makes me feel bad about myself, but yeah, I mean, it's just short. I mean, January, February gets a little dicey, but after that, it's beautiful. I gotcha. I gotcha. Well, like I said, it's great to have you on the show today. Um, I think I think the bookkeeping, accounting, uh, whole money conversation for the small business owner is really complicated and really challenging. And especially for the entrepreneur, a, a lot of the stuff, no one teaches us this stuff. Like we, we're kind of figuring this out as we go. You know, it's like, I want to start a business. And so like, we're kind of doing like, okay, what, what do I legally have to do to like not get in trouble? Um, but beyond that, it, it can be very complicated. It can be very confusing. And so I'm excited to have you on today and really get a, a perspective that's tangible and helpful for the listeners. Because we're, we're frankly, we're, a lot of us are all over the place. I mean, I talked to one listener who he, we were talking about his finances and he was like, yeah, it's really, always really frustrating during tax season because you know I just have one card and like all my money is on that account and I'm like buying groceries with that account and I'm like buying all this stuff. And you know, it's the co- actually, he was saying it was the company card and I was like, but you're using it for like personal expenses. And he was like, yeah, but does that really matter? And I was like, I think that it matters. You know, I'm like, it feels like that should matter. Uh, but that's, that's, that is the small business owner in a lot of cases is is just, I don't know, we're just kind of figuring it out. What's been, uh, what's been your experience in chatting with small business owners? And it, and that's a, the perfect lead in and it's similar and it's, it runs the gamut. Uh, on one end, you've got folks who 
started a business and are doing something for somebody because they have a skill or a talent or a trade that they're good at and they can make money on it. And it's, it's no more complicated than that when they get started. Certainly, there are a lot of things that go into that, like you talked about, um, my bookkeeping, my marketing, um, on the legal side, what, you know, what do I need to look out for? How do I do my banking? All, and there's a whole host of things that, that you need to get right in order to be successful and keep yourself on the right side of the IRS and keep your right, yourself on the right side of the law and um, you know, state and local government and all that stuff. On the, on the flip side, you know, we work with businesses who are well-established. They've been around a long time. They've got processes and procedures. They've had processes and procedures for a long time that are you know, well-rooted and they just want to get better at what they're doing or they need different information or you know, whatever it is. So it, it really runs the gamut. It absolutely runs the gamut. Well, so, you know, you're obviously chatting with all sorts of different business owners. Um, what are some of the most common mistakes or misconceptions that you see uh, new business owners or, or um, people who are young in their business uh, run into? The biggest one that we see actually, and you touched on it, is the bank issue separating business and personal. That is the number one mistake that we see. And people generally, they don't see, they don't see an issue with it, but there are issues with it. Uh, number one issue is, if, you know, if you've got an LLC or any sort of business entity and you're running, you're, you're treating business and personal as one, then you've, what you've done, and I'm not an attorney, so definitely go talk to an attorney about this if this is you. <laughs> what you've done is you've broken the, um, you know, the corporate seal. And that creates some issues if you were ever to get into, um, you know, some sort of a litigation um, situation. The IRS, if they were to come audit you and they said, you know, let us, let's see your books and records, let's go through this. And if they did an actual true audit, you'd have some problems because how are you going to substantiate five years ago or three years ago or, you know, even last month, what was business, what was personal, what you should have deducted, what really is personal. It becomes very, very difficult. And even after after that, those are you know legal tax issues. But after that, if you're trying to run a business and you're trying to figure out where am I most profitable, where is my money going, who are my best customers, um, it, are my margins right, is my pricing right, any of that stuff, you've got to have good financial records. And if you don't have good financial records, you can't make those decision, decisions accurately or timely. And that creates another set of issues just from an operational perspective that that gets really, really tricky. Well, for the for the the young business owner, when we're talking about financial records, bookkeeping, things like that, um, do you typically have people? I mean, do they, is there certain software that you recommend? Do you have an in-house software that people use? Because uh, I've I've seen people who you know you ask them for financial records, and they literally. I mean, I had one guy, and I'm not a CPA in, in any way whatsoever, but I've had conversations with people on their financial records, and I've even had people like bring printer paper. We're like with pen, they've written out like, oh yeah, I spent this and I had, and, and I'm not talking about like a week's worth of budgeting. Like it's a printer paper with like 50, 60, $70,000 of, of cash flow accounted for of, and it's almost like, oh yeah. And I just make a note whenever that money's coming in and going out. And so I, I'm sure there's all sorts of horror stories. W what's like the easiest way for people to get organized and at least cover their first bases when it comes to bookkeeping? Sure. Uh, well, number one, get yourself an accounting software. <laughs> okay. That's, that's the start. Now, all of our clients are on QuickBooks online for a variety of reasons. QuickBooks is, you know, they're the elephant in the room. They're the biggest player out there from... Um, an accounting uh, software perspective. Apart from that, and none of these none of these companies pay me or endorse me in any way, shape, or form. Except those brought to you by QuickBooks. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. Um, but all of our all of our clients are on QuickBooks. The, reason, the vast majority of the reason why is because the ecosystem. Like just when you have an iPhone or any sort of Apple product, you you buy it for the ecosystem. It's for us. It's the same way with with QuickBooks. That said, QuickBooks can be prohibitively expensive if you're a really small business, or maybe it's just not your cup of tea. That's cool too. The other players out there are Zero is probably the second um, largest player, Zero with X, X-E-R-O. FreshBooks is very large. And then for businesses that are really just getting started and need just the basic functionality of sending invoices to clients, we recommend Wave and Wave is free, or at least it was the last time I checked. 
Um, they've been purchased re fairly recently, I believe. But, the, you know, one of those is where I would start. But just have some sort of a software where you can connect your bank account. And hopefully it's a bank account that is dedicated to the business, not your personal account. You can connect your bank account. The transactions are going to come in. You're able to send invoices to your clients and get paid. That's important too, is actually getting paid part and start there. And then once your business becomes more complex, you have other needs. You've got different tracking needs as far as expenses. You need to pay bills. You know, it gets more complex from there. And then we talked about other apps that may or may not uh, need to be folded into the fray there. But that's where we would start. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got to ask you, it's interesting reading your background and um, it's, first of all, thank you for the recommendations. I think it's really helpful reading your background. It, it, I'm, I read that you were a pro golfer and you were kind of the go-to guy for accounting needs. Tell me a little bit about that story. Like where, I mean, were you just, is that just like a, was it just like a side hobby? You just liked accounting? Was it just like a degree that you had gotten? I mean, how did this morph from, you know, the, the golfer to now running your own business. Sure. And the, and the golfer story sounds a lot better than it probably, <laughs> probably was in reality because I like, I'm an accountant now. That's how I make money. That's how I, that, that's how I paid the bills for a long time now. So that mm -hmm. speaks to what my golf skill was when I was doing it for a living, I think. Um, but yeah, so the story there is I played in high school. Uh, I played in college, albeit briefly. And my dad was a accountant, not a CPA, but an accountant worked for an insurance company, um, was treasurer and CFO. Uh, you know, so he worked, he worked his way up the ladder quite a bit. And when I went to college, I wanted to be an investment banker, even though at the time I had clearly absolutely no idea what an investment banker was. And so I was going to go major in finance because I did not like accounting. I had a very bad experience with accounting in high school. Very bad. Got over it, obviously. Uh, and he just sat me down one day and he's like, you know, if you go into accounting, you can do all of the things that you would, you'd be able to do with a finance degree plus a little bit more. So maybe you should think about that. And it also happened that I had a really good accounting professor in my freshman year and, um, it really stuck and I liked it, you know, got an A in class and, you know, from there, it, you know, it just made sense to me to, to go that route. When I was a senior, uh, this would have been April of my senior year. I talked to my mom on the phone and told her like, look, I, I want to go try and try the golf business. Even I had, you know, in hindsight, which is 2020, I had no business going into the golf business at that point. No business. <laughs> I had no business. And she should have, I mean, you know, bless her heart. She was very uh, supportive and said, I'll, I'll talk to your dad. And, um, you know, she got a mistake in a beer and, and told him <laughs> what my plan was. He came down to visit a couple of weeks later and said, you know, we had a discussion and said, well, you know, go do the golf thing and you'll know when you go broke. And that was his advice, which as it turns out, was probably some of the best advice I ever got. Hmm. But uh, I did the golf thing for two and a half years after college. And, you know, it, it went okay, but it was, you know, I was at the stage where I wanted to start a family and, you know, w wasn't really interested in working six days a week, crazy hours. And it, it was just too hard, <laughs> frankly. And, you know, the accounting business was just a much more stable, um, better business. I got into it in 2008, which was right at the peak of the market and um, got into forensic accounting. First claims I worked on were Katrina claims wow. uh, in the forensic world. And then shortly thereafter, we had Lehman Brothers and the financial crisis. So it was, it was just a wild time. But uh, that's that's how I got started. Have you seen any uh, impact on the, I mean, I don't know how insulated the accounting world is to COVID, but I'm curious to hear what this last year or so has been like for you. Yeah, it's been crazy, uh, frankly. In our business, we, we've done really, really well. Um, last year was the best year we've ever had. Every client that we've got had the best year ever, except for maybe one or two. So, you know, they made it, but frankly, a year ago, if you had asked me, you know, what the next year was going to look like sitting here, I, I would say, holy cow, you know, we're, it's going to be, it's going to be bad. Like, you know, the U S economy has never been shut down for any, any period of time, totally shut down. Mm. Uh, the world economy has never been shut down for any period of time. Uh, but, you know, I think we got lucky just in the industries that we serve, basically professional services, businesses. We're big in trades, we're big in marketing agencies, and those businesses did just fine. I'm sure that we'd be having a different conversation if we were in hospitality, restaurants, right. travel, right. anything like that. We'd be having a, a much different conversation for sure. 
How much do you feel like, because you use the word like we're, we're very lucky and I'm, and I'm sure you're being humble in the sense of, you know, I, I know there's decisions we make in our businesses that position us uh, in ways that feel almost nonchalant or it feels just kind of happenstance. But in hindsight, it's like, oh, I'm glad I made that decision or I'm glad we focus on that industry or what have you. But, but in the world of business ownership, you know, we like to make it seem, um, especially those of, those of us who are making it happen, whose businesses are doing really well, many people, especially on social media, like to make it seem like, um, you know, they're business gods. But on the same token, it feels like this luck factor, whether that's luck, whether it's timing, whatever you want to call it, has a pretty big role in our business life. And I don't know if we like to talk about it because it, it's kind of out of our control a little bit. Um, wh what's your take on being lucky as a business owner? That's such a great question. I think there is luck involved. There's luck involved with everything, I think. But in a big way, you make your own luck. If you do the right things, if you're constantly learning, if you've got a great culture inside of your business, if you are really truly serving your clients, if you're talking to them, if you're you know staying front of mind, seeing how you can be helpful, then I think you're going to make a lot of your own luck. And mm. at that point, it's not really luck; it just kind of feels like it, you know. After the effect, um, you know, what we did last year, we took basically two straight weeks in the middle of of March, and I mean, it was at that point it was tax season, truly tax season. It was before they extended it, and I just said, look, we're going to talk to every single client that we've got. We're going to have a meeting with them. We're not going to charge them for it. And we're just going to give them the playbook that, that we've come up with. And we sat down last year and we kind of said, okay, well, this is what we think is going to happen. And this is how we think it should be addressed. And our goal right now is not necessarily to make you as profitable as you can be. It's to get you through at that point where we were saying was it's to get you through July to make sure that you're still in existence in July. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the playbook that we put together. And we just talked to our clients and it was no more complicated than that really. And in that sense, you know, we've made some clients that we're probably going to have for life just because we were helpful in a period of time that was really stressful. And I think we learned a lot about ourselves going through that. Uh, so we made our own luck. But in the same sense, you know, two years prior to that, when I decided, well, we're going to focus on marketing agencies and when we got, um, you know, we just by happenstance got a lot of clients in the trades, those two businesses have done really, really well. If we had if we niche down to marketing agencies who specialized in restaurants, we would be having a totally different conversation. It just so happens that we special we don't really have an agency specialty per se. They they're kind of all over the map. We have a lot of generalist agencies, and so they did okay, and they were able to pivot. But if you you know if, if you set yourself up so that you can pivot, then you know it seems like luck. Mm. Well, I love that mentality, and it's it's almost like the people who aren't successful are kind of eternally the victim. You know, like I have no control whatsoever. And I like your perspective on sort of like these micro decisions that you're making um, over the course of several months, several weeks, even day in and day out that uh, position yourself to, I guess, receive luck <laughs> or receive good <laughs> fortune or blessing or, or what have you. Um, and something else I really liked about your story is you talked about having this meeting with your customers and not charging them. Um, I did something similar where I was meeting with people and wasn't charging them anything for it. I was on the phone with someone the other day who they do work with restaurants and restaurants who were having to now suddenly go online. There was one restaurant in particular that didn't have a Google My Business page, had literally zero online footprint whatsoever. And this company went out of their way. They even went to the restaurant, like took pictures and like uploaded it and got like their Google My Business page going. And the cool thing about the story was I was like, okay, that that's a restaurant that's going to be their customer for life. They're going to always going to work with them because they went the extra mile. One of the things that I like to talk about on the podcast and other places is this concept of building your tribe of 1000 raving fans. You know, those customers who will be your customers for life. Uh, you and I have both done BNI. You're still in BNI, and you know the tagline with BNI is "Givers Gain," which is such a great concept, even outside of BNI. Talk to us a little bit about this idea of how do you really build a customer for life um, who loves to buy from you again and again, who loves to work with you, who happily trusts you with um, not just their bookkeeping but whatever they're paying for. Um, what do you think the secret is to that? 
I don't know that there's really a true secret in my, I can tell you what, what I've done in my business. So I harp on, and we're a team of three, right? So it's me and I've got um, two employees as well. What I do is I harp on the client experience. That's one thing. And I talk about the client experience all the time. We have to be meeting the client experience. We have to be solving our clients problems. And that's just a mindset. If we're not solving their problems then they don't need us. Mm -hmm. So that's like, it's so fundamental. So that's one thing. The other thing that we do is we innovate. And then we do that in a number of ways. There's a focus on um, continuing education. There's a focus on knowledge sharing. And we actually put resources behind that time and energy and effort. And we meet and we actually share knowledge in a way, you know, internally and with our clients in a way that, you know, it's consistent and repeatable. And we do that every single month. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is being really intentional about how we deliver our services. So a lot of clients will come to us, you know, small businesses and they'll say, I just need my books done. And I just need my books done. It's like, okay, well, we can do that. And we can put together your books in December so that you can file a tax return in January or February. And it's very transactional. And we can't, you know, if you give me a pile of receipts in January, I can't help you. I can put together, I can put together a PL and a balance sheet for you. And it is what it is, but I can't really help you because I'm looking at transactions that happened a year ago. I can't proactively advise you. I'm not seeing any sort of trends. It's very much just the transactional thing. And it's just data entry and whatever is the output is the output. And I, I just can't help. What I, what we can do to help is we're going to meet with you either monthly or quarterly on a consistent basis. And we're going to talk about you know, what's going on in the world, what's going on in your business, how can we, and we always ask, how can we be most helpful? Mm -hmm. And if I'm sitting, if I have a relationship with you, if I built a relationship with you, and if I see you on a consistent basis, then I know what's going on in your business. I know what challenges you have. If I'm paying attention to your industry, I know what challenges are coming from the outside that maybe you just don't see because you've got head, your head down, you're in the weeds of your own business. I'm talking to other clients who are in your business and I'm hearing what they are saying. How can I apply that to you? So, you know, being more of an advisor as opposed to this transactional person who just pushes the button on a tax return. And then, you know, I deal with you for 30 minutes out of the year and I just look at your stuff on paper. There's no human connection there that I, you know, we just, it's hard to be helpful in that, in that way. BNI, which you mentioned is, is kind of the same thing. And it's a formulaic way to build the no like and trust factor. Are you showing up to meetings? That's getting in front of people. That's talking to people. Are you having one-to-ones? That's meeting with people and finding out about them and their business and what's going on with them. How you can be helpful. Are you doing your CEUs? That's education, right? Or what are you doing to make yourself better? How can you better advise somebody tomorrow after something that you've learned today? All of that, it's the same, same stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It's just packaged in a different way in the way that we operate our business. Well, you described it so simply. And I think those of us listening were like, yeah, this, this is, this makes perfect sense. Like who wouldn't do business this way? And yet time and again, people, they get, I don't think it's always intentional, but you get lost in this very transactional, um, especially when you feel the squeeze of cash flow. It's like, where's that next sale coming from? How do I make that next sale happen? And before you know it, business can become very transactional. Something else you mentioned, I think, is really important to pause on for a second. Is you know you talked about innovating and um, really just making sure you're on the cutting edge, so to speak, in terms of your knowledge, expertise, serving your clients well. How often do you feel like you're having to battle misinformation or reteach your customers or reinform them? Uh, because what I've noticed, especially in the Facebook social media world, is very good marketers now are selling their product through very, um, uh, it's basically through misinformation. So perfect example of this, an ad that I just saw last week was uh, a um, accountant who was saying, hey, uh, I, can, I can save you, I can give you $5,000 in your pocket for every client you sign. And which I thought that's a really bold claim. 
and came to find out he was referring to basically your advertising uh, deduction, which I don't know what the cap is on that, but he was basically taking that concept and saying, yeah, you know, you get $5,000 or you can uh, deduct five grand for every client you sign because you did advertising to get them. But what he's presenting it as you sign a client and you get $5,000 back in your pocket, which isn't quite how it works, right? So I don't know if you ever see anything that's that overt, but do you ever come across having to uh, retrain, reteach, clarify, you know, clients who like, well, I saw this, I read this, this is what I heard I could do. You know, I mean, how often does that have to happen? For uh, for us in, in our business, not as much as you would probably expect, but we do see it. And what we're seeing right now, if you follow tax Twitter, which is a great hashtag on Twitter, um, if you're in our business and if you're dirty and you like taxes and stuff like that. But if you follow tax Twitter, what we're seeing a lot of now are these TikTok influencers who are basically giving tax advice over TikTok, which is not, it, it's not, maybe they're not giving the best advice. I'll, Don't I'll do that is that. what I'm hearing from you. <laughs> yeah. I got a, you know, I got a, I've got a very young, very, very young client who's fairly new. He sent us a question last week with a screenshot from Reddit about some tax advice. And it was, I mean, you know, in a you know 200 word Reddit post, I mean, how much, how technical can you really get? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? You know, we see that and we, you know, we see people who read stuff or they see stuff on CNBC or they read stuff in Forbes or whatever. And generally the questions that we get are more along the lines of, I saw this, does this apply to me? Mm-hmm. And the art is really in the response there. So you would say, this does apply to you because of X, Y, and Z. And then I'm very, very careful. I always link to guidance, authoritative guidance, because there's guidance and then there's guidance. I'm going to link to an IRS or I'm going to put a screenshot from the IRS website in there. I'm going to link to an IRS document or mm-hmm. you know, something from the AICPA who, you know, or the Journal of Accountancy. Those are all you know, authoritative sources that have been vetted. And that's the way that we handle it. So you give the best answer that you can back, how it applies to that, to that person, and then you source it. But the, you know, the sor- I would say the sourcing is the key, really. What I'm hearing you say is everyone just needs to hire an accountant <laughs> and stop. Because here's what I've noticed, even on Reddit, like people, because I, I follow like the business Reddit and the small business Reddit, and people will give like the most bold-faced, wrong piece of advice, but they say it, and it's just the social media world we live in, people say it with so much confidence these days. And like, this is exactly how it is, even though it's nothing to do with that. What I'm hearing from you is um, everyone just needs to hire an accountant. They just need to hire you rather than going to TikTok for their tax advice. Yeah, that's, that's part of it. Like, don't get your tax advice from TikTok. Don't get your tax advice from Reddit. Probably don't get your tax advice from social media unless it's somebody that you actually know. That is definitely um, part of it. The other piece of it, too, is you need to hire ad- advisors. And it's not just accountants. But if you're new to business, if you don't have a business background, and you're getting into business because you, you're going to do something that you know how to do. If you're an electrician and you're going to open your own business as an electrician, then that, that's your business. You probably didn't go to school to learn accounting. You probably didn't go to school to learn anything legal. You probably didn't go to school to learn marketing. Those are all things that you should outsource. So do what you do well and stick to that. And then the rest of it, outsource. Get yourself a trusted advisor. Make sure that these are people that you're talking to. You can even, I mean, there's free resources out there. I mean, you can go to score, you can go to the, the SBA. Just somebody that you can talk to who's been there mm-hmm. and done that and can give you good, solid advice that's that's rational, basically. I love it. Well, Chris, you've given some great advice today. What can my listeners do to connect with you, to follow you, to maybe even work with you? Um, what does that look like? Yeah, and I appreciate that. Best way to find me is betterwaycpa.com. That's the website. All the contact information is there. And we've got a new ebook that's out for our agency owners. It's called Scaling the Data-Driven Agency. And that's betterwaycpa.com slash scaling the data-driven agency. I love it. Chris, thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thanks so much, Blake. I appreciate it. 
Hey, for our listeners, I'm going to put the link to that ebook down in the episode description below. Make sure you check out the website, betterwaycpa.com. And hey, if you're a first time listener to the podcast, what the heck are you waiting on? Click that subscribe button. So keep bringing you good advice wherever you are. And lastly, don't forget if you love the podcast, which of course you do, we're on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash good advice if you want to support the podcast or if you even want to get your business promoted on the podcast. Again, you can go to patreon.com slash good advice. That's all we have for you today. Thanks for listening and we'll catch you later. See ya.